So since their peak in the early 90s, we've seen um, approximately a, a three quarters decline in teen birth rates. And then since 2007, they've declined by about two thirds. Um, so from a public health perspective, this is just a tremendous phenomenon. Um, and the reason for this uh, change in teen birth rates is, is nuanced. We can look to a few different factors, um, but we do look to factors like access to effective contraception. Um, we look at better information about sexual health um, coming from parents, uh, coming from online resources, coming from schools and doctors. And then also we look at um, just a change in perspective on how young people view the prospect of early parenthood. Um, but it's not all good news. So if you go to the next slide, the CDC um, just recently released teen birth data for 2022. And we did see the first increase in Texas teen birth rates in 15 years. Um, so this was a small increase. It was less than half a percentage. Um, but it reverses a long trend of decline, and the Texas teen birth rate increased even as the U.S. teen birth rate continued to decrease. And concerningly, um, we saw that teen birth rates for our Black and Hispanic teens increased, while birth rates for white teens continued to decline. So we saw an increase in our existing disparities. Um, Texas now has the eighth highest teen birth rate in the nation. Our rate is 50% higher than the U.S. rate as a whole. Um, so a lot of, of work that we have to do to make sure that our young people in Texas have access to effective prevention. Um, go on to the next slide, please. And we also have a lot of concerns about rates of sexually transmitted infections. Um, in contrast to teen birth rates, we are seeing increases in rates of sexually transmitted infections um, in the last year alone. And so this data is from a slightly different time range. Um, we're looking at STI rates for 2021, which are the most recent dates that we, uh, data that we have at a granular level for Texas. And we're looking at the change from 2020. Um, in this year, we saw decreases in HIV for our young people, but we did see increases to chlamydia, gonorrhea, and an absolutely frightening increase in rates of syphilis uh, in our young people. So among uh, people aged 15 to 24 in Texas, we saw a 37% single year syphilis increase. Given that we had come close to eradicating syphilis in the last century, this is extremely concerning. Um, in Texas and nationwide, we do see a majority of cases of STIs occur in people under the age of 25. Again, um, from a public health perspective, this really speaks to the importance of prevention education among our young people. So going to the next slide. All right, and so that brings us to our presentation today. Um, so we will be looking at the landscape of sex education in Texas, and then looking at resources for school districts to implement high quality sex education. Here in Texas, we have a lot of different layers of control about sex education. We have our Texas legislature, which writes the laws that guide sex education. We have the State Board of Education that adopts minimum curriculum standards for health education and sex education. And then we have a whole lot of local control that occurs at the level of local school districts and school health advisory councils. Um, school health advisory councils, if you're not familiar with them, are volunteer groups, um, which can include some school staff and administrators but a majority of members on these shacks or school health advisory councils are actually parents um, who are representing the values of the community and shacks make a recommendation on curriculum selection for health class. So go on to the next slide, please. So historically, how have we provided health education in Texas? Um, so in the state, health class is required at the elementary school and the middle school level but it's an elective at the high school class. So that means that uh, students are not required to take health class, and in fact, districts aren't even required to offer it. And so as a result, we see low numbers of Texas students who historically have received any sex education at all. And what they received was likely to be abstinence only um, and not provide additional information on topics like contraception and STI prevention. Um, we have some research from 2017 
um, that shows that in that time period, only 17% of Texas school districts were offering what we refer to as abstinence plus sex education. The remainder were offering abstinence only sex ed or no sex education at all. But we see that changing. So go to the next slide. So in November of 2020, for the first time since Titanic was in the movie theaters, our State Board of Education updated our Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills for Health Education. So these are our TEKS. There are minimum curriculum standard that we have for every class and every grade level. The TEKS in health education include some sex education content. And these new standards were implemented in the 2022 to 23 school year. We have seen that many school districts have not actually fully implemented them, but for larger districts, we are now in our second year of implementation. So what do these new standards include? Go to the next slide. So we've got our basic nuts and bolts information about how the body works, right? We've got our standards on puberty, menstruation, human anatomy, human reproduction. Um, we have a continued strong focus on abstinence as the best and safest choice for young people um, in compliance with state law. We also have age appropriate information on birth control and also on STI prevention, screening and treatment. And we also have some really high quality information on healthy relationships and mental health and also on respecting the boundaries of other people. So crucially, these new standards are offered in the middle school level. Um, so if you recall from the prior slide, health class is required at the middle school level. So that means that these new standards that are now in effect do pull some basic age appropriate sex education into seventh and eighth grade, when in theory, if we're doing this correctly, all Texas students will receive the instruction. So what is not included in these required standards? We don't have information about consent. So we do have information on respecting the boundaries of other people, and we do have a little bit of information on the legal age of consent, but we don't have general information about consent. Um, we also don't include any standards that address sexual orientation or gender identity. So as I always like to tell my districts, the TEKS are the floor, they're not the ceiling. These are the minimum standards, and districts always have the option of teaching beyond the TEKS if they so choose. Let's go on to the next slide. So we've got these new standards, but what do our laws say about sex education? So these laws are all located in the Texas Education Code uh, 28004. So state law requires what we call abstinence first instruction. So we have to um, teach our students that abstinence from sexual activity is the preferred choice of behavior, is the best and safest choice. But we also can include information on topics like contraception, like on condoms, on uh, prevention of sexually transmitted infections. Um, and indeed, this information is now built into our minimum curriculum standards. Um, we can do condom demonstrations, uh, but we are not allowed to distribute condoms within a health class. And then finally, we have significant statute around local control and parent rights. And we saw some major changes here in the 2021 legislative session. So go on to the next slide, please. So these are some of the new laws that school districts have to comply with uh, when they're teaching health class or sex education. Um, these laws apply to any instruction on sexual and reproductive health, and then also apply to any instruction on the prevention of child abuse, family violence, dating violence, and sex trafficking. The most significant of these changes was the implementation of parent opt-in provisions. So previously, parents had the right to opt their children out of sex education, pull them out of any class they didn't want them participating in. Now we require active written consent in order for students to participate. And this does raise concerns that there are students who are missing out on this important instruction, not because their parents are opposed to it, but because they are not able to uh, complete the paperwork because there are other uh, red tape or administrative barriers. Um, we also had an expansion of parent notification about sex ed. We've always had parent notification. That notification got more thorough. And we also had an expansion of parent rights to purchase or review curriculum. Again, parents could always review the curriculum, but there were some changes to make it more convenient for parents. 
We also had some major changes to the district adoption process for sex education. That process is now longer. Um, it's more laid out in state law and requires several open meetings. And then we also had some changes to school health advisory council meeting procedures to make them more transparent. Um, and so all of these changes um, are things that school districts have to comply with. And so we'll talk about some tools that we have for school districts uh, to help them navigate these new laws. So go on to the next slide. All right, so in about 10 minutes, we've talked about um, a whole a whole huge amount of change uh, in Texas. We have new curriculum standards. We have new state laws and all of these things um, require action by school districts. So what is it that school districts have to be doing now or what should they have already even done in the last year? So first off, they have to adopt instructional materials that align with the new health education TEKS. Again, these health education TEKS are mandatory in elementary and middle school. We know that not all school districts are actually providing this, um, but school districts should be adopting these textbooks that align with these new TEKS. School districts have to comply with these new laws around parent notification, around cur curriculum access, around opt-in. We need to train our teachers. We can have the best curriculum in the world, but if our instructors aren't prepared to deliver these new standards, um, they won't be effective. So school districts are working to make sure their teachers are well equipped. Um, we have a lot of community expectations around sex education um, that school districts are trying to align themselves with. We know that a large majority of Texas parents do support sex education um, because they want their kids to be safe and healthy and they want schools to be partners. We also know that we have some families and some communities um, that have lower levels of support. So that's something for school districts to navigate. And then finally, we like to say there is no star test for sex ed. We don't have a whole lot of statewide oversight into how any of these processes are going. And so that falls on outsiders, on researchers, on nonprofits, um, and on community members and parents themselves to try and make sure that our schools are delivering sex ed in an effective way. Um, so that was a whole lot of information. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Um, but at this moment, I will pass it back to Dr. Peskin to talk about some resources that we have for districts. Thanks, Jen. <clears throat> so I was just going to add, um, in order to help districts kind of proceed with some of these next steps in order to you know help them adopt these instructional materials, comply with state laws, um, ensure instructors are trained, help ensure community support, we have developed some resources um, that can help districts do that. Move this slide forward. So as Jen had just mentioned, there's a lot of um, challenges with um, implementing sexual health education in Texas. Um, and I just wanted to sort of reiterate a few of those here. There's really a lack of guidance on how best to approach the issue. So all of these sort of um, legislative mandates come down, all of these different procedures, but school districts are sort of left to sort of navigate it themselves and to try to figure out the best way to you know, approach the issues. Um, like Jen said, there is a lot of community support actually for sexual health education, but there's actually a, a large perceived lack of support from administrators and parents. So people seem to think that um, people are not supportive of this. Of course, school districts have a lot of other things they need to do, lots of competing priorities. And like Jen mentioned, um, a lack of training. <clears throat> and then we just wanted to draw your attention in particular to evidence-based programs. So the guidance for uh, the Texas law is about um, TEKS and the minimum standards. So we um, sort of take that a bit further and try to think about um, sexual health in terms of evidence-based programs. And in addition to sort of meeting those TEKS, let's also try to implement these evidence-based programs related to sexual health. And there are a lot of barriers related to that as well. So school districts also often have a lack of knowledge that some health programs have strong evidence of success, and they often don't know where to find evidence-based programs. So why the focus on evidence-based programs, so sexual health evidence-based programs? So these are really important because they are grounded in strong research methods. Um, they've been rigorously evaluated. Um, They've used rigorous research methods in the evaluation. They've been published in a peer reviewed journal and produced positive behavior changes at least three months post implementation. 
and um, they are effective in changing behavior in the study population. And that's really important in terms of thinking about whether a program will be um, efficacious for, for youth, is, you know, whether it has actually been shown to change behavior as opposed to um, only increasing knowledge. Um, Evidence-based programs are often are also ready and available to use, and they are also a more efficient use of limited resources. So some characteristics of effective programs are that they are based on theory, they reinforce key messages, they are medically accurate, they include activities on social pressures, they integrate skill building activities, they're interactive, they use personalization, they are age appropriate, culturally appropriate, sufficient in length and use committed teachers. So in order to um, help comply with these legislative mandates and to help school districts implement um, sex education in Texas, and in particular evidence-based programs related to sexual health education, um, we developed iChamps. And iChamps is a web-based decision support system and toolkit that can help school districts and community organizations adopt, implement, and maintain effective sexual health curricula or sexual health EBPs. We actually developed iChamps um, back in 2014, 2015, um, and then recently um, we updated the website and the tools to reflect the new statutory changes and to guide educators through the new processes. And this is a screenshot of what um, the iChamps website uh, looks like here. Um, iChamps is actually uh, based on evidence. It's based on the CHAMPS model, which stands for Choosing and Maintaining Effective Programs for Sex Education in Schools. It's a seven-step model, and um, this model was informed from um, empirical research, um, work with uh, community, um, community partners. We did extensive focus groups and interviews with school personnel to really understand um, the process of how school districts adopt, implement, and maintain um, sexual health programs in school, in schools. So this is a seven step model, um, prioritize, assess, select, approve, prepare, implement, maintain. And it's all about um, implementation science in terms of getting effective programs out to uh, the people, out to youth in schools. So it is uh, providing strategies to help um, school districts get those programs implemented in their schools. So in terms of prioritize, um, what we mean by prioritize is that we want school districts to prioritize sexual health for their district. Um, we want them to assess their district's needs and resources, uh, select a program for their district, get their program approved, prepare for program implementation, implement the program as intended with fidelity, maintain momentum for the program, and ensure support for all steps of iChamps. And so what iChamps does is it provides tools and resources to help school districts go through um, each of these steps of the CHAMPS model. So there are three major features of iChamps, and I've included uh, the website here. It is available free of charge um, to any school district who would like to use it. Um, and there are three major components to iChamps. There is a, a CHAMPS model tutorial, which really helps people understand the basics of the CHAMPS model where it came from, how to use the iChamps website. There's also a staging tool that I'll go into in just a minute. And then there's also a very extensive tools library where uh, school districts can get a whole host of resources to help them um, through the process of moving through that CHAMPS model. So just wanna say a little bit about the iChamps staging tool. And this really helps people understand where they are in the CHAMPS, in the, in the CHAMPS model. And so what happens is it's used to determine the district's level of readiness for adopting, implementing, and maintaining sexual health um, EBPs. And each question will help the staging tool better understand where the district is by generating a report on where uh, the school district should focus first and what tools might be most useful. So um, this is sort of an example of what uh, the staging tool looks like. And then in the next slide here, this is an example of um, someone who has gone through the staging tool. And here, um, the green indicates that you've completed the step. The yellow indicates that you've accomplished some of the tasks, but might benefit from additional work on that step. 
And then the red implements indicates that you've not completed any of the prescribed tasks. So what happens is a user can go into iChamps and they can answer a series of questions and based on their answers, um, the tool will tell them whether or not they've completed each of these steps. And so, for example, here, um, the person went through the, the staging tool and um, they've completed some of the, the steps in prioritize, assess, and select, um, but they, um, have a, they have gotten a program approved. And so the tool is telling the user that um, they think that they are in the prepare uh, step. Um, and so they, they give the, the CHAMPS website, then gives the user recommendations about um, what tools might be helpful um, to sort of proceed. And then it also um, gives them some additional resources to help them um, just go back and we sort of refine the work they've done in these previous steps as well. So it gives them some examples, it gives them some guidance in terms of, you know, where they should go first in terms of the iChamps website. Um, and this just helps to really tailor the experience a little bit more for the user. So there are over 50 tools that are available to help champions move through the process. And I should have mentioned that um, iChamps really is designed for those champions um, in the school district who are really interested in getting a program adopted, implemented, maintained in their schools. Um, so, and a champion is, is very broad. It can be a parent, it can be a school district member, um, really anybody in the community who's interested in trying to uh, get programs um, used in their schools. So as I mentioned, there's 50, tool, 50 different tools, um, but there are five tool types. Um, the first tool type is the step overview. So for each uh, step, prioritize, assess, select, there's a video that describes the goals for a step and how to use the tools for that step. So up here is a, a screenshot of the step overview for the select step, and you can see that Dr. Hernandez um, gives some guidance about um, what users should expect by going in the select step. We also have success stories. So we have videos from school district stakeholders discussing how they were able to successfully adopt, implement, or maintain effective sexual health education. Um, we know that it's really important um, to have um, role model stories and to hear from other people who've been successful with this process. Um, it can be a challenging process, so hearing from others is always really helpful. And this was somebody that we worked with um, in the San Antonio area who provided some, some feedback on their process. We also have some facts and tip sheets. So we have PDF documents that summarize factual information or strategies that are critical to accomplishing the tasks in a step. We have helpful links, so existing website links that can provide external resources. And then templates, which often people report as the most helpful are these customizable documents that can meet your district's needs. So here you can see this is a customizable implementation plan template that a school district can use when they're planning for the implementation of um, their program. So some of the updates that we made to iChamps based on the new legislation was um, ensuring that tools reflected the new statutory changes. So uh, changes in terms of how um, um, programs were adopted and moved through the school district process, the approval process, um, the opt-in, um, process that's now required, um, alignment with um, the new TEKS, helping um, school districts understand which programs are aligned to those TEKS. Um, that was sort of the primary focus of the updates that were made um, in the last couple of years. A secondary focus was replacing outdated references, updating broken website links, and making aesthetic changes. And as a result of our work, um, we created three new facts and tips tools to provide users with critical information regarding the new opt-in process and the newly adopted TEKS. And Dr. Hernandez will, will show you a few of those in just a minute. So this is um, an overview of our tools. And it um, again, like I mentioned, there are five different uh, tool types. Uh, across the top here are the steps. And then down each column are the different tools that a district can use that can help them um, through that step. So as we just talked about before, that person who completed the staging tool had completed the approved step, but they hadn't completed you know, all of the um, items in the select step, so they could go back here and take a look at any of the tools here, and then of course move forward um, in the process as well. And you don't have to use a staging tool, it's just um, a, something that can help you. 
um, but really any tool is available for use. It's really designed to be very user friendly and to allow people you know, to find the tools that really uh, meet their needs. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hernandez who is going to talk about some of the tools, some of the more specific tools. Thank you, Melissa. So like um, Dr. Peskin had said, um, the staging tool is an optional tool. I think it's a really great tool to start with if you have no idea where you're at. It's also a great tool to start with if you think you know where you're at, but you just wanna confirm. Um, because oftentimes, um, you know, a school district may have some idea and know where they're at and what they want to do. Like they say, well, we're at the select, we're ready to select a program, but then they haven't talked to school board members. You know, there's some other needs assessment that could, that needs to be done that will help them later on when they're ready to get a program approved. So that's my number one recommendation is to start there. Now, once you, you know, but some of you may be like really eager and want to get started. And here's some tools though at, within iChamps that we feel um, would be helpful that are a good place to get started if you're in different stages. These are just tools that we have found too from other school districts who have talked to us and who we've worked with and found really helpful. So these are tools for a good place to get started when you're thinking about adopting a program. And so first, you know, just trying to find a program um, that best fits your district. Um, so we have the school health advisory council. So we have a fact sheet. It's a SHAP 101. We know many districts struggle with cre um, establishing SHACs, um, making them effective. And so we have a bunch of um, facts and tips on, on what you need to do to create an effective SHAC. We also have a facts and tip sheets on understanding the Texas law. We know that there's a lot of changes that happen and that can be really confusing for a lot of school districts. We have a facts and tip sheet that really breaks it down really by, you know, section by section and tells you um, how to interpret that section of the law. One of the most helpful tools that we've heard from school districts is our um, evidence-based program selection guide. So it's basically this big Excel spreadsheet. We see it like as an inventory of evidence-based programs that talks about the, re the outcomes that they found with the evaluation, but it also includes information on resources that are needed, like is training a requirement and how much does it cost for uh, teacher manuals and student manuals or activities. So um, things like that, um, which we find school districts uh, find that really, really helpful for them. Um, but we've also a new tool that we developed as part of the changes that happened at the state level was um, this evidence-based program that takes objectives alignment. So we went through some of the most common um, curricula that we knew were being implemented in, in Texas uh, to see how well do they align uh, with the new TEKS. And so we, we have the, uh, like, Every program has a little fact sheet that says, you know, if it's fully meeting all the TEKS, it's partially meeting them, and or if it's not meeting it at all. So, and then we also give some tips on how to, if it's like a partially met, you know, TEK, um, we give tips on like, how can you improve the program so that it fully meets uh, the TEK objective. And then finally, we have a facts and tip sheet on a school board approval process. You know, this can be, um, a process that's really long and tedious, and we've given a lot of facts and tips just from our experience in working with schools and school districts on what's worked for them, um, what that process is like to you, how to get on the agenda, what are kind of some helpful information to present to the school board. So those are all some, some of the tools that we have that we found to be really helpful and effective for school dis districts when you're in, in the adoption stage, when you're just kind of looking for a program. And next slide, please. Okay, um, and here are some of the examples of the tools that I just mentioned that are on Shack. Um, and so I encourage you to go to the iChamps website and you can download and look at these um, in more greater detail, but you see the Shack 101 on the left, upper left-hand corner on the right-hand corner um, is where we have um, our, tips and facts on um, the Texas law and understanding Texas law. Um, and the bottom left hand is our selection guide. And then on the right hand, um, bottom right hand is um, all the programs that we reviewed that and how they align with the TEKS. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and here are some tools that are a good place to start when you're when you're ready to implement a program. Um, the first is adapting programs. So we give a guidance on how to adapt programs while maintaining those core elements so you can ensure that those programs are, are effective and they stay effective. We also have parent notification letter. Um, and this is all updated too, where there's new requirements in the state, you know, law regarding like notifying parents. We've updated this, so it's all, you know, in compliance. Uh, we also have an intro to Texas opt in requirements, and this is brand new too for a lot of schools and well, for a lot of schools and school districts. And so we found that a lot of districts just kind of needed some more guidance on that. We actually have some actual templates that you can download for opt in. Um, as well that you can download and that you can customize it for your particular district um, or school, but they all have the required um, wording and language that's now needed um, as part of the new changes in the law. So it's a great place to start and to get, you know, to download, look at it with your shack, look at it with your district and make changes as needed. We also have a pre and post test too for those school districts who are interested in doing an evaluation and actually evaluating the program to see if this program is the best program for them and if it's fitting and, and to make sure that they're getting the programs, the outcomes that they expect to see. Um, it's also a great way to advocate, to continue advocating for that program so you can continue to implement it as well. And again, those are surveys that are adaptable. You can use all the questions, some of, or just some of the questions. You know, it's kind of up to the district on how they want to do that. Next slide, please. And again, here are the example um, tools that um, screenshots of them that are just I just talked about. So, we try to really, really break it down into really simple terms on the types of adaptations that you can make with a program. So that's what you see in the top left hand corner in the upper corner on the right side um, is an example of the uh, consent form there's a lot there's more to it um, so this is just a section of the um, tool that we have in the template um, but it shows you how you can adapt it and you know insert your district name your school name um, on the bottom left hand corner are the um, are our facts and tip sheets on um, the new opt-in policy and what that means for a district and then on the bottom right hand side is um, an example of our survey. So next slide, please. Now, what tools um, should you use if you're in the main maintenance phase? And so you've already implemented the program and now you want to maintain it and continue implementing it in future school years. Um, we have several tools for that. So um, one is a facts and tip sheet on interpreting your findings. You know, how do you interpret some of the outcomes that you you've observed, especially with those surveys? And so we talk about how do you interpret them? How do you present them? You know, to also the school board or to those decision makers. Uh, we have a guidance sheet and maintenance plan. So we're th things to consider um, as you continue to implement the program and how to, you know, sustain that support um, as well. We have some also facts and tip sheets on some of the sexual health, like education, some of the common myths that school districts often encounter when they're um, talking to um, administrators um, or other stakeholders. So um, just some like tips on, you know, debunking some of those common myths. And then we have a facts and tip sheet on mobilizing key personnel. So again, trying to figure out, you know, the best way to, to sustain that program. How do you support the teachers that are teaching the program? How do you support the administrators? Um, and so we have some facts and tips on that. Next slide, please. And again, here are the screenshots of the different tools. Um, you know, um, again, on the left hand side is that maintenance and how to interpret those findings. Uh, the, on the right hand side, on the upper right is the, the maintenance plan and a sample of that. And again, these are just things that to consider um, while you're thinking about maintaining that program and implementing it in future years. On the bottom left hand side are the common myths and that's our facts and tip sheets on how to debunk some of those common myths that you may encounter. Um, 
And then, oh, on the bottom right hand side is also your like maintenance plan for, you know, reporting and really recognizing um, those teachers that have implemented the program and really recognizing the success of the program. Next slide, please. Okay, so those are an example of all the tools that we have um, on iChamps. Um, when we developed iChamps, uh, we did a usability study to see what districts thought about it. Did they find it was easy to use? It was difficult? Was it credible? So this was with the original. I'll go through it briefly with the original iChamps. So this was tested over a three-week period, and we had 16 stakeholders across um, school districts in Texas in 2014. So we had a representation of 16 school districts across Texas. And... Um, they all use different components, you know, the features, it was all kind of self-driven. We said, here's an, here's the iChamps, we want you to use it, tell us what tools you use, if you found it helpful. We did a survey before we gave them access to iChamps and then afterwards, and then they were given a gift card after they completed the surveys. Next slide, please. So this is the demographics of our same polls. So you can see we had the majority were female, 62% um, were white, 31% were Hispanic, and 6% were black. Um, we had a good representation in, um, in regards to district sizes. So we had 45% came from large uh, school districts, 36% were from medium, and 18% were from small. Um, and in terms of their role, um, we had a lot of um, nurses, so we had like 18% were nurses, 12% um, were administrators. Um, we also had teachers, 18, almost 19% were teachers. We had some parents as well look at it, and they usually had like a role in their like community, the shack. Um, and then some were um, others, you know, there were like community coordinators or community partners that worked really closely with school districts. So you can see to the years in the district. So we had 43% um, had been in their district, either five, one to five years, 18% um, were there six to 10 years and 31% were there um, 11 to 20 years. So, um, and we had 87% were part of their shack. So it was a good, um, nice sample. Next slide, please. So overall, this was a finding from the original iChamps, and overall, we found this uh, iChamps to be have high usability ratings. Just overall, ninety three percent, you know, almost ninety four percent like the program, the website a lot. Over, you know, about half felt that it was easy or kind of easy to use. Eighty one percent felt that it was helpful. Um, and a lot of them had high um, perceived impact where they thought it could help them in adopting, implementing, or maintaining a program. So vast majority did felt that. Everybody thought the iChamps was credible and everybody said that they would um, recommend iChamps to other people or they would use it again. Next slide, please. So we also asked about like the different features, if they liked it, what they thought about them, like if they liked them, if it was easy or hard to use, or if they didn't, you know, use it at all. And you, here again, you can see that the majority of participants really liked the iChamps either a, a little or they liked it a lot. And many of them thought it was easy or very easy uh, to use. So everything from the iChamps videos, zip overviews, success stories, and um, facts and tips, helpful links, all of that. Um, everybody um, thought the only area that we was the discussion board, but actually that wasn't a, a big feature at the time too. So um, we did have that. There's plans to can, to have a discussion board, um, but right now it's not active right now just because we were getting a lot of spam. So we're trying to increase the security of it before it goes um, back up live. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so as you know, and we've talked about, we made a lot of changes to iChamps. We updated the tools, everything to make it more in compliant with um, the changes at the state level. So with that, we did another usability study to see what people thought about it. So this was more recently and did the very same kind of methods uh, as we did it with the first one. Um, this time we had eight independent school districts across Texas um, look at it, and they were given access to iChamps for two weeks. Um, and again, they were given a survey afterwards and they did, you know, receive a gift card. So same methods, exact same thing, um, but with now the new updated tools. 
Next slide, please. And in terms of um, usability testing, what they thought, everybody thought it was acceptable. 89% said it was um, very easy to use and 100% thought it was um, more helpful than their current resources that they had for adopting, implementing, and maintaining um, programs, sexual health programs. Next slide, please. Um, and again, everybody said, this was again of the nine, uh, eight school districts, um, everybody said that they would use it again, 89% said they would recommend it, um, and 89% reported that the information um, was trustworthy and accurate as well. So, again, really high overall um, ratings for these usability uh, in terms of the usability aspect of it. Next slide, please. So we also asked um, the school districts, what are some of their barriers to implementing these evidence-based programs um, as well? So in this case, we had um, seven of our participants who answered this response, but you can see something to highlight here. You know, there were barriers related to some of the logistics of it. So like funding, for example, there were some personal barriers as well. So concern, uh, well, one is, you know, the teacher comfort level in teaching a sexual health um, program, concerns about parent reactions. Um, that was by, you know, 71%. The biggest barrier though, you can see that was with like 100% all of our participants who answered this question was that active parental consent. So um, that was our biggest barrier. And we know this is gonna be a challenge for school districts um, and we recently did a report on that. So um, let, that was led by Dr. Peskin too as well on um, how this may impact schools, but it's something that we're still looking at and we're trying to, you know, still yet to be determined how big of an impact this will have um, in our school districts. But you can see many of our participants, all of them thought that this was a big barrier. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, a summary and next step. So as you can see, iChamps, you know, it's web-based decision support system. It's really geared for school districts, those working with school districts to help them through um, adopting, implementing, and maintaining programs, especially given with all the changes that have happened in the recent laws. Um, you know, we found that school districts were just kind of not ready for it for some of these changes. So this is a great tool for those um, who feel that they're lost, they don't know where to start. Um, this is a really great resource. It takes a lot of the guesswork out on how to approach some of this stuff. It, you know, like I said, a lot of our templates already um, are designed to be compliant with a lot of the laws um, that in the new statutes, you know, the requirements that are laid out in there. And, uh, like we see time again, a lot of the school districts really, really like it. They rate it highly favorable. They, in some of our anecdotal interviews with them after completing it, you know, they said this is a really comprehensive resources resource that other uh, school districts should have. Um, right now, in terms of the next steps, um, we have a grant that's um, been reviewed through the NIH. We're just waiting for Congress to pass their budget. <laughs> and once the budget passed, um, we've been talking with the NIH and they really um, like our program and they want to fund it um, to do a more rigorous evaluation to see um, if it actually helps school districts um, adopt and implement program um, an evidence based program. So, um, so if there's something that you're interested in, if you're in a school district and you're thinking, you know, this might be something you want to use, please feel free to contact us too. And if you want to be part of that study, because we will be looking for school districts to recruit um, to use iChamps and to see if it helps them or not. Um, and I think that's it, right? I think next slide, I think that's the end. So I think that's the end. We have some time so we can open it up for any questions. Thank you, Tim, for a fantastic presentation. It was great. And it's a fantastic resource. I was just wondering uh, if I could, um, you know, thank you for an excellent presentation. I was just wondering if we had any uh, visitation data. If, uh, has anybody pulled any Google Analytics off the thing? Yes. Or, 
<laughs> and I don't have the, the hard, hard numbers off the top of my head right now, but I do know that it, we have looked at that. Um, and especially once the um, changes happen, we did see an increase in traffic. Um, we also worked closely with Healthy Futures too and been pushing out, you know, the what iChamps is. I also know though too, it is being used across the, U the US. We've, we've seen, I've, you know, it's not just Texas, multiple other states, um, according to that Google Analytics, have accessed it um, anywhere from California to South Carolina, you know, it's been all over where we've seen um, users. Yeah, I was going to ask about the translatability of iChamps across borders because it has a universality to it, despite the Texas legislation addition. So it's terrific. And some of our more common tools that are being accessed are the SHAC 101 and parent notification and the opt-in parent form. So those are kind of our top um, tools that are being accessed just based on the Google Analytics. Is there a manuscript in the works? Um, not so, yet. <laughs> I don't know. We recently, we recently did a, a, a nice panel at APHA where we presented um, a series of uh, papers on our work related to this topic, and one of them was on the, the iChamps updates. And so we are um, in discussion to potentially talk to a journal about um, some articles that we can put together. So it's, it's, and we do have someone who's been working on a manuscript related to this. So it's, it, it's in the works. Sounds like a great special issue to me. Any other uh, questions or chat items? Um, Efrat Gabay said, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's great to see the updates and progress being made on iChamps. Thank you, Efrat. It's a, it's a lot of information, I think, too, with iChamps, because it is um, a lot of tools. So I don't think we have it on there on the slide, but if we wanted to, it's iChamps.org for anybody who wants to view iChamps and go on there and get access to any of the tools. And I just put the, um, yeah, we, I realized I should have put it on the, the last slide, but I just put the, the link there in the chat. And so, yeah, definitely feel free to click around. Um, it's you know, free of charge, you can download any tool that you'd like um, and just, you know, we're, we're always interested to hear how people are using it. So if you are using it and you find it helpful, we'd love to hear from you.